Welcome once again to Talking Point. I'm Mayor Mike, and my guest on this episode is our city attorney, Logan Beveridge. Logan, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you for asking me to be here today. So what I wanted to do um, with your office, we're trying to go through all the departments, talk about what we do. Give us an idea of what the city attorney does, how it was created, and what your responsibilities are. Similar to the other officers throughout the city, the mayor, the comptroller, et cetera, uh, the city attorney is a position that's created by statute. It's uh, uh, Chapter 62, Section 09, Sub 12, and it has statutory duties that are listed out. Uh, and, and what I do day to day conforms to that uh, for the most part, but also goes beyond that. Uh, anybody who wants to look that up can, I won't, <laughs> I won't read it in detail here, but. Uh, you know, day to day, my uh, typical duties primarily uh, focus on just advising staff members. Everyone from yourself down to any employee within any uh, department. Uh, so typically that uh, would go to department heads and then to the managers below them, which could focus on uh, a wide range of issues, everything from uh, basic government compliance issues such as open meetings and open records, which are common to all departments all the way down to things that are very, very specific, you know, uh, something related to a DOT issue affecting the bus, uh, the bus system or um, matters related to a right-of-way work permit where for somebody putting in a driveway um, and, it, and it goes down to the Public Works Department for permitting issues. So uh, general things all the way down to very specific things. Sure, and I know that we work together a lot um, evaluating contracts, uh, memorandums of understanding, any sort of agreement or uh, maybe even negotiations that the city deals with. Those are the top levels. Uh, but first and foremost, you're, you're an elected position um, and you represent the interest of the city. Now that doesn't necessarily mean my interest or anyone else's interest specifically, but the city as a whole, correct? That's correct. My client is the city of Stevens Point as a municipal corporation, and uh, I have a legal obligation to uh, represent uh, the interests of that client the same way that any attorney would have in representing an individual or a business uh, or anything like that in private practice. Now, in, in actual practice, uh, what that means is that I provide advice to the people who represent that organization, i.e. yourself and the council, as to uh, what the law requires them to do, what discretion they have under the law, and uh, what uh, a given action uh, could result in. You know, I make predictions about right. uh, how a court might look at something uh, or how a particular negotiated type situation might play out if it were to uh, progress further towards a litigation situation or something along those lines. Right, and the, and the philosophy that I look at and I tell the older persons too is that, you know, you ask five different lawyers the same question, you will likely get five different opinions. But the city attorney is the one that's hired to represent us, and if it push comes to shove, it's your opinion that, that really matters for the city. Um, so regardless of what other lawyers or people who stayed at a Holiday Inn Express tell you, um, you're the one that we really uh, should be taking the advice from. Well, I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I would hope so. If, if so, it means I'm probably giving good advice. No. Um, but that doesn't mean that I go it alone on everything. Uh, there are certain situations that come up from time to time where uh, even though I may be confident in an opinion I'm giving, uh, I, I know that the best practice is to reach out to a network of other attorneys that are in similar positions to myself throughout the state and uh, see if anybody else has seen a similar situation and has advice to chime in uh, on that topic. Or of course the uh, League of Municipalities has two attorneys that are on call so to speak, uh, yeah, for any sort yeah, of questions I've, I've that come up. I've used before, too. Um, so you also advise the alders on parliamentary procedure, uh, open meetings and Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, I believe you're designated as our parliamentarian, mm -hmm. the person who interprets Robert's Rules. So talk a little bit about um, your guidance when we have a meeting. Um, I always look to you to make sure that we're, we're staying on track. Um, if, if we get into a little bit of a gray area, I look to you for that advice. Uh, talk about open meetings and why agendas have to be listed and why discussion has to stay on those particular topics. Open meetings law in the state of Wisconsin comes from a, a section of chapter 19. And the fundamental purpose behind it is that government should be done in the open, in the sunshine, and have easy access for uh, the public to engage with it. Not just to know what's going on, but to actually engage with it. And uh, in, in Stevens Point, we actually take that a bit further 
in that we have ordinances that allow for public comment on all subject, um, subject to a few narrow restrictions, uh, which goes beyond what's required under statute. Uh, but the basic elements of it are that we have to provide notice to the newspaper of record, uh, publish notice in, you know, in hard copy on the wall mm -hmm. at, the, at City Hall, and of course on our website, which isn't part of the statutory element, but probably the way that most people see the notices uh, nowadays. We have to announce the time, the date, obviously the location, which has to be something easily accessible to members of the public, and have uh, agenda items listed in a manner that's specific enough to inform a member of the public uh, and allow them to make an informed decision as to whether or not they're interested in attending. It doesn't have to be exhaustively precise about exactly what's going to be discussed, but a general idea of uh, what the topics are going to be. And the, and the discussion revolving around those topics have to be germane to the topic. We can't talk about, for example, uh, installing a new uh, shelter at Mead Park and then start talking about the shelters at Iverson Park, correct? That's correct. Uh, if you make an agenda item narrow, uh, it will constrain what uh, you're able to talk about because somebody who might have an interest in the shelters at Iverson is going to look at the item for Mead and say, well, it's not the park in my neighborhood, so I'm not going to go to that meeting. Uh, but if discussions started happening about the one in their neighborhood and they weren't there, as you've just done a disservice to that member of the community. Sure. Uh, so we have to keep uh, discussion uh, on point while, of course, also uh, trying to allow it to be as broad as we can. Um, but at the same time, you do have the, the Roberts Rules issues, as you mentioned, which is a big, heavy book with a lot of rules in it. <laughs> uh, typically, we don't really have to consult that because the, the basic level of understanding that everyone has for it um, is enough to run the meetings. Every now and then, one of the finer, more esoteric points will come up yeah, as we see from time more, to time. There's more than a few of those, too, sure. Um, s talk about, about um, your office. You, you don't work alone. Um, you have Becky in your office, and you work very closely with um, uh, Carrie downstairs and, and Judge McKenna. Uh, talk a little bit about what your office does on a day-to-day -day basis. Sure. And, well, independent of, independent of just the general advice that I provide to city staff members, and we can go into some of the more specific topics on that later. Um, you mentioned Becky. She, uh, Becky Collado is the paralegal for the city. Um, she's uh, been working with the city for quite a bit longer than I have and uh, certainly provides an incredible resource and depth of knowledge uh, that she brings to the table um, and, and actually has a, a background in certain topics like real estate and wills and trusts and uh, things that, that I don't have actually the level of knowledge that she does just because she's been working with it for a lot of years. Uh, but her and I work very closely on, on everything, but uh, she has a, a huge role in the municipal court uh, matters that I handle, which is, you mentioned uh, Carrie uh, Joswiak, who's the clerk of the municipal court, and uh, Judge Mike McKenna, who's the municipal judge. Uh, we did set up the municipal court about two years ago, uh, and that's where municipal citations are handled. Now that can be everything from traffic citations up to and including uh, first offense OWI, which is the most serious offense that the municipal court would look at. Uh, what we call non-traffic citations, that would be your disorderly conduct, um, alcohol violations, other violations of city ordinance that don't have anything to do with automobiles. Okay. And also the other types of programs the city runs for uh, you know, property enforcement, uh, property maintenance, um, in the event that somebody has a property maintenance issue that goes unresolved after numerous communications from city staff, there is the uh, possibility that a citation can be issued. That also would be handled through the municipal court. Yeah, and I want to point out real quick, too, that the goal isn't to give citations for those ordinance violations, the, the property maintenance code. The goal is really to just resolve the issue. Um, so we, we work very diligently with people to try and avoid that. But you're right, there are people that, um, for whatever reason, choose not to comply with the ordinances on the books and they're going to get a citation potentially at the end of that. That's correct. And I've even had situations where we've had citations issued, mm -hmm. uh, scheduled a trial after the person pled not guilty on it, and then prior to the trial the person took care of the issues and I dismissed the tickets because that's ultimately what we're trying to, trying to get done. But then you do have situations, you know, where it's say a rental property owned by somebody who lives in San Antonio and is happy to collect the, collect the rent check every month. Uh, but doesn't really ever 
send a contractor to take care of basic maintenance items, and you end up with a property that doesn't look very good. And uh, those are some of the times where we have to uh, really work through the court process a little bit uh, more diligently. So um, uh, getting back to the day-to-day -day operations, um, other than you know, municipal court uh, and things like that, can you give the, the public here an idea of you know, some of the things that you review? Because you cover seriously uh, an entire gamut of things sure. from one end of the spectrum to the other end. Yeah, there's a, you know, obviously when you mention contracts, uh, it goes way beyond just negotiating things and uh, litigation if there's some dis disagreement about it. Uh, but drafting of development contracts, if we're working on uh, something where the city's involved with a, an incentive of some type, usually in our TIF districts. Uh, contracts for just basic products and services. Um, some of the most uh, jargon-filled ones I've ever looked at have been for some of the software systems that we've purchased. Yeah. Um, for all the viewers at home, just those things that you scroll through really fast and then click, I the agree. And user agreements, sure, yeah, I read yeah. that. I have to actually read them <laughs> and, and try to make sense of them from time to time. Uh, but also ordinance uh, amendments, um, agreements between, you know, intergovernmental agreements, you know, between the city and, say, Portage County uh, or uh, with, say, the Village of Whiting, where we have an interconnection agreement for water service as sort of a backup uh, water system. Um, and... Uh, any type of other contract you can think of. Sometimes things involving real estate, land, leases, um, all right. sorts of things. You know, and, and you get uh, corporation councils that are specific to one business, perhaps, or one area of expertise. But what I said is true. You literally have to know an, a whole gamut of things because the city has contracts with individuals, with companies, with other municipalities, with federal agencies, state agencies. Um, all, all sorts of things that you have to have the the breadth of knowledge uh, to at least understand what they're saying and not put the city in a situation where it may come back to bite us. Um, so that's got to be tough. Uh, and well, I know as well as collect, collective bargaining agreements oh, as well. Yeah, so forgot about those. Contracts with, with contracts. our employees, our employee units for uh, uh, transit, police, and fire. Um, we go through bargaining on that every every few years. And then, of course, the administration of those contracts um, while they're in place, uh, there are legal issues that come up there as well. Uh, but you mentioned sort of the specialization in some of the other organizations. Uh, every year I go to a conference for the municipal attorneys and speaking to some of the, the assistant city attorneys for the city of Milwaukee, they've got over 30 attorneys in their, <laughs> in their office down there. So everybody's able to have a fairly narrow range of specialization. Yeah. I spoke to you know, one friend of mine who does nothing but real estate foreclosure yeah. year in and year out for the city of Milwaukee. And she asked me, well, if you're the only attorney for the city, how do you know how to do everything? And I say, <laughs> well, I don't. <laughs> but you stay at a Holiday Inn Express. <laughs> Th things come up pretty frequently where it's something I've never thought about even, and I have to go to the statutes, go to regulations, read court cases, and try to get a grasp on what's going on. And occasionally those are the times where uh, you re really do need to reach out to the network and, and ask some of your friends. And yeah, you've got see some what good resources got. there, too. And I imagine, I mean, research probably plays a big role in your, your typical day, too. It does. Uh, usually, if a topic is confusing at first, if you drill down on it enough, you can find someone else somewhere who's dealt with it. Um, that's kind of the nature of how the courts work. We don't have to reinvent something every time. You look to what the courts have done previously, and those set precedent as long as they're appeal courts or uh, the Supreme Court. Now, one of the difficulties is that Wisconsin, compared to a lot of other states, doesn't have a lot of people in it. Uh, so sometimes certain types of topics, the courts really haven't had much to say. And uh, those are the situations where you've got to rely a bit more on your instinct, rely a bit more on uh, what the legislature uh, intended when they put a law together or what you think they may have intended to try to make a, an, an educated guess and give a, a good advice to your client. Okay. Uh, another big aspect of your job is the municipal court. Now you mentioned it briefly that we created this municipal court two years ago. Talk a little bit about why we created it, what advantages it has, uh, talk a little bit about our partnership with the village of Plover in that municipal court, um, and then you know, maybe what you cover. Well, I'll talk briefly about what it was like before we had the municipal court, because that'll demonstrate it best. It used to be if you got a speeding ticket in the, in the city of Stevens Point, the lowest category speeding ticket, it was $175.10. And I think everyone agreed that for you know, doing 
38 and a 25, that felt a bit excessive. Moreover, if you wanted to challenge that in court, you had to be able to appear at 10 a.m. on a Monday, which for most people isn't very convenient with their work schedule. Right. So, uh, well, going beyond that, if you wanted to actually have a trial on it, then you were at the mercy of the, the circuit court docket, which can be very crowded. They have to handle all sorts of other matters in the circuit court. So pursuant to state statute that allows for this, we created a municipal court that handles just the types of matters that I mentioned before. And we did that, in, as you mentioned, in conjunction with uh, the Village of Plover. So it is the Stevens Point Plover Joint Municipal Court. And now if you get a citation for speeding, lowest category, it's $98.80. So cut it just about in half. And if you want to come in and have a discussion about it or challenge it, you come in at 5 p.m. on a Thursday, which works a lot more conveniently for most people. And in the event that we're going to have a trial on it, if we can't come to some sort of agreement, uh, usually we can schedule that just in a matter of one to two months down the line, or even a matter of just weeks sometimes. So everything just moves uh, more quickly. And Judge McKenna only handles those matters. So uh, because of that and because of just the volume, uh, he becomes very familiar with uh, the nuances of each one of those uh, particular types of citations. And the whole process just works more efficiently than it did when we were in the circuit court. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about those savings that you talked about. Prior to the municipal court, uh, your fine was higher. Uh, talk a little bit about, because I don't think most people understand that the actual fine is relatively small. It's all of the court costs and things like that that get added up that really make it the, the large sum of money. That's right, and that's also why you end up with sort of these odd numbers, you know, $98.80. Where did that come from? Uh, the actual forfeiture for lowest category speeding, I believe, is $30. And what you do is you go to a table in the back of the bond book, and you scroll over to the correct column, and you add in the local court fee, which uh, is somewhere in the realm of uh, $28 to $35. Um, then you add in a percentage of uh, the initial fine, and that's a surcharge that comes from state statute. You add in another surcharge for you know, the jail surcharge. If it's an OWI, you add in this driver improvement fee, which is about $435 mm -hmm. in that case. And that's how you arrive at this, at this number that shows up on the ticket that you receive. So when, it, when a ticket comes in, the, the money doesn't all go to the city, or it used to not go to the city, but it was split up between several different entities. Uh, because of all those different fees. The state took a piece, the county took a piece, the circuit courts took a piece, and then if there was any programming, um, they took a piece of that too, right? That's right, and it still works uh, essentially that way in the municipal court. The local court fee goes to pay for the salary of uh, Carrie, the court clerk, and the judge, as well as any sort of overhead for office supplies and utilities that they have. Uh, and then the jail surcharge would go towards the, the local jail, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually a portion of it does go back to uh, the city coffers, uh, but that was the case with the circuit court as well. It's just that now with the municipal court, a little bit larger share uh, goes to the city than previously. Yeah, you know, and, and we, we go back to when we were talking about the property maintenance code violations. The goal is not to make money or to put people in jail or to make them pay fines. The goal is to just get people to get along and do what you're supposed to do as a responsible citizen. So that I tell people all the time, just don't break the law. If we have about 110 OWI first offenses a year mm -hmm. in the municipal court. If that number went to zero, we would have a serious budgetary issue, <laughs> but I would count it as a great success for that our community. That would be a good success, yeah, yeah. You know, one thing we, that the city relies on you heavily for is ordinances uh, and interpretation of the ordinances that are on the books and opinions on if, uh, well, for example, you know, we tell people to not break the law, but if you don't like that law or if you think that law is outdated or, or wrong or not needed anymore, mm -hmm. we always have the opportunity to change it. So become involved, solicit your older person, uh, and we can look at changing those. We rely on you heavily to put the proper wording in to accomplish what our thoughts are. I have an idea, for example, to say, um, lift the overnight parking restriction on the city streets. Mm -hmm. Now there's some nuances there that we'd have to work through, but ultimately the wording of that ordinance would be left up to you to put it into legalese I want to say we're not going to worry about parking uh, overnight on the streets between May and November, um, and I'd leave it up to you to put that into words. So let's talk about the ordinances, how you interpret them, uh, and, and where we go from there. 
Well, ordinance interpretation, just like interpreting any sort of piece of law, statute, or regulation, the first thing you start with is just the plain text. And if it's well drafted, you'll never have to go beyond that. So that gets at the number one rule you have when you're writing those types of things is avoid vagueness. You don't want to be able to read it and have it be subject to more than one interpretation. And that's why sometimes you look at laws and they're hard to understand. It's in order to avoid being vague. And if you really start diagramming the sentence down, you can figure out what it's saying. Even though it might look like a lot of words, what ends up happening is that once everybody takes the time to really break it down, it's tough to disagree about what it means. And if it's tough to disagree about what it means, that means that it was well written. Yeah. Assuming it does what you actually wanted Good. it to do. Uh, for instance, uh, a great example uh, was the chronic nuisance ordinance. Okay. Um, it was somewhat controversial when it was passed. Uh, some people had really big concerns about it based upon the language they were seeing in the draft. And it was kind of hard to work through at first glance to figure out exactly what works with it and you know how the different notices get sent to whom at what time. It, it looked a little intimidating uh, for people who aren't used to reading statutes. Uh, but ultimately, now here we are a few years later, and when it came up for renewal after the sunset clause, mm -hmm. we hadn't actually used it. Yeah. And I think part of that is that, and I, I know for certain that part of it was that the fact that it was there meant that certain things wouldn't become problems in the first place. We had one issue with a particular uh, business where it was the first time we were considering potentially using it, mm -hmm. and that business owner came to the city and engaged with us prior to it even reaching that point. And I'd like to think that having it on the books contributed to that. Again, the, you know, the, the goal here is to get people to do the right thing. It's not to exactly. give them a citation. So in that regard, it was successful. Yeah, uh, you know, I would it, agree. It worked. Um, one thing that always got me was the difference between, you know, I always look for may and shall. Uh, and, and you kind of pointed that out to me too, is when, when you're reading something, May means there's a possibility. Shall means you will do this. Um, so the words are real important. You probably would be uh, pretty good auditing Jim Oliva's questions for trivia because <laughs> everybody picks apart the, the trivia questions and says, no, you didn't ask for this name. You asked for that name or you didn't specify. So I can understand the, um, the, the specificity of the words involved. Um, we're, we're constantly looking at our ordinances and, and changes uh, that are potential uh, for review. Bring it up. Is it still relevant? Do we still need it? Do we need to tweak it? Um, from your opinion, where are we going as we move forward with that? And you know, thanks for bringing that up. It was a topic I wanted to uh, discuss, which is uh, ordinance recodification. And what I mean by that is taking our entire code. It's got 32 chapters, maybe 33, yep. <laughs> and uh, and sort of recreating it uh, with some some changes, not really to the policy underlying it. Uh, but changes to update things that are just out of date. There are references to state statutes in there in the format that they were in in the 70s. So you can look up those old versions of the law and trace it forward to figure out where it is now. Mm -hmm. uh, but that becomes pretty cumbersome, especially if it's just you know uh, a general member of the public who's trying to figure something out and looking at the code. So updating those types of things, getting rid of sections that aren't enforceable anymore because of changes in state or federal law, uh, getting rid of things that are just old, you know, everybody loves to look at the lists of funny old statutes about, you know, you can't serve a meal on the cross without butter, or, you <laughs> know, whatever it is. Um, and also just making it better organized. You know, one example that I can think of off the top of my head is we have Chapter 24, which is our offenses against public peace and order. It's essentially our kind of the city criminal code, if you want to think of it that way. But it's not criminal, it's just ordinance violations. That's where you have disorderly conduct harassment, mm -hmm. um, that type of thing, theft. Uh, but then meanwhile, in the chapter about the police department, we have resisting obstructing an officer, which is an offense that you'd be issued a citation for, uh, but it's in this other chapter. Okay. I think it would make a lot of sense to put that under chapter 24, along with the other list of you know, municipal offenses. So just one of those little examples, not that that's one that's going to confuse the sure. public or anything. Um, but just those organizational things where you take things and put them where people would look first. Um, but also formatting, having consistent formatting from uh, chapter to chapter and making sure that it's something where um, you can keyword search it and uh, easily find what you're looking help. for. So that's, that's something I'm hoping that we're able to do 
uh, over the next year or two. Obviously, it'll be somewhat of a slow process because there's a lot of material. Work through it one chapter at a time and uh, come up with something that is just a little easier for people to use and navigate. Okay. Good. Uh, and, you know, you mentioned our ordinances. Our code of ordinances is online at stevenspoint.com. It's available by chapter, not as user-friendly and searchable as I would like, uh, but you can scroll through it and usually find something uh, that is relevant to you. Uh, we also have our mobile app. Uh, you can do it from the Google Play Store or uh, the Apple Store uh, and look at Stevens Point. Uh, try and find the Stevens Point app, download that for your smartphone or tablet. Um, and uh, as I said, the website. Or if, if people have questions about ordinances, they could probably call your office or my office or, or talk to their older persons um, and, and get clarification on that. So, um, Absolutely. I field quite a few calls uh, directly from uh, members of the public. Okay. And uh, if anybody out there would like to get in touch, my number is 715-346-1695. And that'll go straight to Perfect. me. Perfect. I want to point out, too, that um, you, you won't give legal advice. That's, that's not in your job description, especially for that's citizens. Right. You will legal, uh, give legal advice to the city as a whole, um, but you're not there to give legal advice to citizens. What should I do in, in the property line dispute or, or things like that? That's right. Uh, I can give advice to people if they're seeking to do something uh, where a city ordinance would have an impact on it. You know, you're looking to get a license to do, you know, open a restaurant. Well, not a restaurant uh, because that's the county for the that's most part. But uh, for a tavern, you know, we had somebody come in um, just uh, last week to seek a beer and wine license for a restaurant. Okay. And I was able to uh, work through those people on the process there. Um, but you're right. If there's a property line dispute between... Uh, two individuals, um, they'd need to contact their own private legal counsel in order to get advice. Right. Good. Um, well, if anybody has questions, um, you, you gave out your phone number maybe one more time? It's 715-346-1695, uh, and my email address is abeverage at stevenspoint.com. Okay. Um, so if anybody has any questions regarding our ordinances or what happens in municipal court, uh, feel free to give Logan's office a call or my office a call or contact the alderman for your district. The alder person for your district is also listed on stevenspoint.com and our mobile app. Uh, thank you for joining us once again. And until next time, I'm Mayor Mike along with uh, Attorney Beveridge, and we've been Talking Point. <laughs>